grasped the concept of linearity, look at this general differential equation a sub 0 times y plus a sub 1 times y prime plus a sub 2 times y double prime through a sub n times the nth derivative of y all equal to 0. Don't worry about all this sub stuff. Basically, we just have a long series of numbered terms starting with the 0 term through the nth term, or the last term. The a's are all coefficients of the y's and y primes. This equation is linear if and only if two conditions are met. First, all the a coefficients are constants or functions of x, and second, the y's and y primes are not raised to a power. Therefore, in order for this equation to be a linear differential equation, we need to rewrite it as a sub 0 of x times y through a sub n of x times the nth derivative of y equals some function b of x. All this terminology may be making your brain boil, but an example or two should cool things off quite a bit. All this terminology may be making your brain boil, but an example or two should cool things off quite a bit. Take the differential equation x to the fourth times y double prime plus the quantity x cubed plus one times y prime plus the tangent of x times y equals x squared plus the square root of x. This differential equation is linear because all the coefficients of the y's are functions of x and none of the y's are raised to a power. Don't be thrown by the x squared plus the square root of x on the right hand side of the equation. It doesn't matter what you have on the right hand side so long as it is a function of x only. Now if we were to slightly modify the equation we could screw the whole thing up. Watch. Let's change the x to the fourth in the first term to y to the fourth. Based on the first condition of a linear equation, which says that all the coefficients must be functions of x only, this equation doesn't fit the form anymore because now we have a function of y as a coefficient. So, this is no longer a linear differential equation. It's something much more frightening. Deadly radon gas! Just kidding. Actually, it's now just a harmless nonlinear differential equation. As you may have gleaned, a differential equation that doesn't satisfy the conditions of linearity is called a nonlinear differential equation. What genius comes up with these names? Here's that linear differential equation of ours again. Now let's change the y prime in the second term to y prime squared. There we go again, changing a perfectly good linear differential equation to a rotten old nonlinear differential equation. This time, because of the second condition, which says that none of the y's and y primes can be raised to a power. Let's switch it back. There we go. All better now. Okay, now on to another method for classifying differential equations. Differential equations are also classified by order. Here we have dy dx equals x squared plus 1. This is a first order differential equation because the highest order derivative is dy dx, which is a first order derivative. Remember, it is the highest order of the derivative and not the highest exponent of the coefficients that determines the order of a differential equation. Now here's the tricky one. Is this a second order or a fourth order differential equation? We have a second order derivative in the first term and a derivative raised to the fourth power in the second term. Upon closer inspection, we see that the second term is just a silly old first order derivative raised to the fourth power. Since the order of the derivatives determines the order of the differential equation, this is a second order differential equation and not a fourth order differential equation. And by the way, did you notice that this is a nonlinear differential equation? Why? Because the dy dx is raised to a power. Remember, that was one of the rules for linearity. None of the derivatives could be raised to power. And well, this guy doesn't follow that rule. Let's review. We've just learned that a differential equation is linear if, and only if, two conditions are met. First, all the coefficients of the y's and y primes are functions of x. And second, the y's and y primes are not raised to a power. We've also learned that the order of a differential equation is simply the same as the highest order derivative in the differential equation. That's all. Section C, Solving Differential Equations. And now the moment we've all been waiting for. Solving differential equations. Simply put, the solution to a differential equation involves finding a function, y equals f of x, which when plugged back into the original differential equation, satisfies the equation for all values of x and y. 
So in essence, we're trying to solve for the dependent variable, usually y. This is easier said than done. It's also tastier grilled than fried. Okay, so we're out to solve a differential equation. The easiest thing to do is to simply integrate, just like we did in calculus. Let's find the solution to the differential equation dy dx equals 4x squared. Before we can integrate this equation, we need to move the dx over to the other side with the 4x squared. Why? Because we're trying to get the dependent variable, y, all by itself. To do this, we multiply both sides by dx. The dx's on the left cancel out, leaving us with dy equals 4x squared times dx. Now we can integrate. What we got to do here is integrate the whole equation. To do this, we integrate each side separately. Integrating, the integral of dy is just y, and the integral of 4x squared is just 4 thirds x cubed plus c. Don't forget our old friend c, the arbitrary constant. We still need that arbitrary constant there to represent the infinite family of solution curves for the equation. Note to self, don't forget the C. This graph shows the family of curves that make up the solution of this differential equation. There are an infinite number of identical curves that correspond to this solution because there are an infinite number of values for C. As we learned back in calculus, when we do an integration, we must always add an arbitrary constant. A solution that has an arbitrary constant in it is called a general solution to the differential equation because it does not give us a unique solution, but rather a family of solutions. If we wanted a unique solution, we would need a specific value for C. How do we get a specific value for C? I am glad you asked. To get a specific value for C, which would give us a unique solution, we need to have a constraint on the differential equation. This constraint comes in the form of an initial condition. An initial condition specifies a point or points through which a solution curve must pass. An initial condition is usually given in the form of an x value with a corresponding y value. For example, suppose you're given the initial condition y at 1 equals 0. This means that when an x value of 1 is plugged into the solution, we get a y value of 0. This tells us that when x is 1, y is 0. This also means that the solution curve passes through the point 1, 0. Let's use this initial condition for the differential equation we just solved. Remember, the original equation was dy dx equals 4x squared, and we found the general solution to be y equals 4 thirds x cubed plus c. Adding our initial condition of y at 1 equals 0, we can now find the corresponding value of c. To find c, all we need to do is plug the initial condition into the general solution and solve for c. So, let's plug in y equals 0 and x equals 1 into y equals 4 thirds x cubed plus c. This gives us 0 equals 4 thirds times 1 cubed plus c. Solving for c, we get negative 4 thirds. Plugging this c value back into our general solution gives us y equals 4 thirds x cubed minus 4 thirds. So, this is our unique solution that passes through the point 1, 0. Let's look back at our graph from before. This graph shows the family of solution curves for the equation. Plotting the point specified by our initial condition, 1, 0, we can now identify the specific curve that is the unique solution passing through that point. That's it here. Oh, and there's the <coughs> raccoon again. Always getting into the family of curves. Hey, get out of here, you! <sighs> A differential equation with a given initial value, like the problem we just saw, is called an initial value problem, or IVP for short. Now, don't mix up IVPs with VIPs. A VIP is a very important person, and an IVP is an initial value problem. You wouldn't want to put an IVP in a VIP tent. Now, let's tackle a second order differential equation. Suppose you're going net gathering with your friend, and come upon this equation, y double prime equals x. Our job here is to figure out what y satisfies this equation. Since this is a second order differential equation, we need to integrate twice to find y. Integrating our equation, y double prime equals x. With respect to x, we end up with y prime equals 1 half x squared plus c. We'll call our c, c1, for now, because when we integrate this a second time, we will introduce another constant, 
After a second integration, we have y equals 1 6 x cubed plus c1 times x plus another constant, which we'll call c2. Remember that the antiderivative of a constant is just the same constant times x. So the antiderivative of c1 is c1 times x. This is the general solution for this problem. Notice that now we have a grand total of two. Count them two constants of integration in our answer, both c1 and c2. So because we have two constants, to find a unique solution to this problem, we need a total of two, count them two, constraints to find values for those constants. Our original problem was y double prime equals x. Let's add the initial conditions y at 0 equals 3 and y prime at 0 equals 1. Notice that both y and y prime are taken at the same point, x equals 0. In any IVP problem, the y value and its derivatives are always specified at the same point, in this case, 0. To solve this IVP, we need to substitute these values into the equation for y and y prime. Integrating earlier, we found y prime equals 1 half x squared plus c1. Integrating the second time, we got y equals 1 sixth x cubed plus c1 times x plus c2. Now let's substitute our initial conditions into these equations. For the y prime equation, the initial condition is y prime at 0 equals 1 which means we sub in x equals 0 and y prime equals 1. Subbing in, we get 1 equals 1 half times 0 squared plus c1, or 1 equals c1. So, we found the value of our first constant, c1, to be 1. For the y equation, the initial condition is y at 0 equals 3, which means we sub in x equals 0 and y equals 3. Subbing in, we get 3 equals 1 sixth times 0 cubed plus c1 times 0 plus c2 or 3 equals c2. So we found the value of our second constant c2 to be 3. Now that we have c1 and c2 we can fill them into the general solution for y which we found earlier. This gives us the unique solution y equals 1 sixth x cubed plus x plus 3 and that's our final answer. So there you have it, you freaky folks. That's how you solve an IVP. Notice what we did here. First, we found the general solution of the differential equation. Then, we used the initial conditions to solve for each constant. And then we put it all together in one big, happy family portrait. Like this one here from the Nussbaum family reunion. For differential equations of second order and higher, there's another type of problem which you may run into. It's kind of like the initial value problems we just did, but it's different. This type of problem is called a boundary value problem, or BVP. The main difference between an IVP and a BVP is all in the type of constraints you're given. For an IVP, you're given the Y and its derivative values at the same point. For a BVP, you are given the Y and derivative values at different points. Let's look back at our last IVP example, y double prime equals x. Here, our initial conditions for y and y prime were both taken at the same point, zero. In a BVP, on the other hand, the y and y prime would be taken at different points, like zero and five, or three and seventeen, or whatever. Just remember this important distinction. If all conditions are given at the same x point, then it's an IVP. If you've got different x points involved, then it's a BVP. Got it? The method for solving a BVP is the same as that for solving an IVP. First, you find the general solution for the differential equation. Then, you can find the values for the arbitrary constants by using the constraints you're given with the problem. Let's do one now. Okay, so we got this here differential equation, y double prime minus y equals a big old fat zero. We'll review the technique for solving this differential equation later in the tape. But for now, let's say that we found the general solution to be y equals c1 times e to the x plus c2 times e to the negative x. Notice that there are two arbitrary constants in there because this is a second order differential equation. And hey, y'all remember e, don't you? e is the representation of a specific number. 2.718 dot dot dot. That comes up all the time in the math world. The rule about e is that if e is raised to the power of x, then its derivative is itself, just e to the x. Now back to our example. 
The boundary conditions for this differential equation problem are y at 0 equals 0 and y at 1 equals 1. Notice that we are specifying y at two different points now, y at 0 and y at 1. If this were an initial value problem instead of a boundary value problem, we would be specifying y at one point only. But now we're ready for the big time. Two. Count them two different points for y. So let's solve this baby. To solve a BVP, the first step is always to find the general solution to the differential equation. In our example, we've already been given the general solution. It's y equals c1 times e to the x plus c2 times e to the negative x. The next step is to substitute the given boundary values into the general solution and then solve for c1 and c2. The first constraint, y at 0 equals 0, means we plug in 0 for x and y into the general solution. Doing this, we get 0 equals c1 times e to the 0 plus c2 times e to the negative 0. Now, 0 can't be positive or negative, it's just 0. Knowing that anything to the 0 power equals 1, we get 0 equals c1 times 1 plus c2 times 1. This simplifies to 0 equals c1 plus c2, or negative c1 equals c2. We'll use this relationship in a second to get our final values for c1 and c2. So keep this info under your hat for a minute while we do the next boundary. The second constraint, y at 1 equals 1, means we plug in 1 for both x and y into the general solution. Doing this, we get 1 equals c1 times e to the 1 plus c2 times e to the negative 1. c1 times e to the 1 just becomes c1 times e. So our equation is 1 equals c1 times e plus c2 times e to the negative 1. Now you can pull out that stuff you put under your hat a second ago. Remember, using the first boundary value, we found that negative c1 equals c2. Let's use that relationship now to nail this one down by plugging in negative c1 for c2. Plugging in, we get 1 equals c1 times e minus c1 times e to the negative 1. Factoring out a c1, then dividing by e minus e to the negative 1, we get c1 equals 1 over the quantity e minus e to the negative 1. Now, C2 is simply equal to negative C1. So, C2 equals negative 1 over the quantity E minus E to the negative 1. Now that we have values for C1 and C2, where do we go from here? Well, we simply go back to the general solution which we were given and fill them in. The general solution here is Y equals C1 times E to the X plus C2 times E to the negative X. Filling in the values for C1 and C2 gives us y equals 1 over the quantity e minus e to the negative 1 times e to the x minus 1 over the quantity e minus e to the negative 1 times e to the negative x. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our answer. This graph shows the general solution to the differential equation. The highlighted points show the boundary values specified by this particular BVP. Now that we've gone through both an IVP and a BVP, we can say some things in general about these types of problems. First, we can say that they're fun on a date as long as you don't have to have them home by 1030. And second, we can be sure that for a differential equation of nth order, the solution will contain n arbitrary constants. Notice that the last few problems we did were of order 2, and we had two arbitrary constants in each one. Okay, review time. Simply put, the solution to a differential equation involves finding a function, y equals f of x, which when plugged back into the original differential equation, satisfies the equation for all values of x and y. We find that solution by integrating the differential equation. Remember, when we integrate, we must add an arbitrary constant c. A solution with arbitrary constants in it is called a general solution because it does not give us a unique solution, but rather a family of solutions. To get specific values for c, which would give us a unique solution, we need to have constraints on the differential equation. These constraints come in the form of specified conditions, which specify a point or points through which a solution curve must pass. There are two types of problems initial value problems, or IVPs, and boundary value problems, or BVPs. 
The main difference between an IVP and a BVP is in the type of constraints you're given. For an IVP, you're given the Y and its derivative values at the same point. For a BVP, you're given the Y and its derivative values at different points. To solve an IVP or BVP, you first find the general solution for the differential equation, then find the values for the arbitrary constants by using the constraints you're given. That's it! Section D. Verifying the solution of a differential equation. One last thing before we move on to bigger and more complicated things. This is called verifying the solution of a differential equation. And it's something else. The method we use here is to check to see that the differential equation and any conditions are satisfied by the given solution. How do we do that? Well, we just plug the solution into the differential equation and see if it holds water. We then do the same with the initial conditions. Let's try this on the differential equation we looked at before y double prime minus y equals zero. Let's determine whether y equals one-half times e to the x minus one-half times e to the negative x is a solution to this differential equation. On top of that, let's throw in some initial conditions, just to make it interesting. Say y at zero equals zero and y prime at zero equals one. y at zero equals zero and y prime at zero equals one. Now, uh, because the y and uh, the y prime values are given at the same point zero, this is in fact an IVP, okay? That was the rule, as you remember. Now, to be able to plug the given solution into the equation, we need both y and y double prime. We've already got y. It's one-half times e to the x minus one-half times e to the negative x. That's the solution we were given. So to find y double prime, we got to find the second derivative of this solution. How do we do that? Well, we just got to differentiate this baby twice. Differentiating, the first term stays the same because the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Now, the second term becomes minus negative one-half e to the x because the derivative of e to the negative x is negative e to the negative x. The two minus signs change to a plus and we're left with y prime equals one-half e to the x plus one-half e to the negative x. When we take the derivative again, the only change will be that the plus sign in the middle will change back to minus. So the second derivative is the same as the original, y equals one-half times e to the x minus one-half times e to the negative x. Now that we have y and y double prime, we can plug them into the original differential equation y double prime minus y equals zero, and see if they hold water. Plugging in y double prime and y, we get one-half times e to the x minus one-half times e to the negative x minus the quantity one-half times e to the x minus one-half times e to the negative x equals zero. Notice the y double prime terms and the y terms are the same. Therefore, just like Godzilla and Mothra, these cancel each other out and we're left with zero equals zero. So this solution satisfies the differential equation. Wait a minute here. So now we know that the solution satisfies the differential equation, but I thought we had some initial conditions to deal with as well. Remember y at zero equals zero and y prime at zero equals one? Whatever happened to those guys? Okay, let's haul those two initial conditions back in here and see if they hold true in the solution. To test the first initial condition, y at zero equals zero, we need the equation for y. Well, this is just the equation for the general solution we were given, y equals one-half e to the x minus one-half e to the negative x. Plugging in the initial condition, which translate to x equals zero and y equals zero, we get zero equals one-half times e to the zero minus one-half times e to the negative zero. Since anything to the zero power is equal to one, this simplifies to one-half times one minus one-half times one, or just one-half minus one-half, which is zero. Zero equals zero, so this condition is met. To test the second initial condition, y prime at zero equals one, we need the equation for y prime. Well, this is just the first derivative of the equation for the general solution, which we found earlier to be y prime equals one-half e to the x plus one-half e to the negative x. Plugging in the initial condition, y prime at zero equals one, which translates to x equals zero and y prime equals one, we get one equals one-half times e to the zero plus one-half times e to the negative zero. 
Again, since anything to the zero power is equal to one, this simplifies to one half times one plus one half times one, or just one half plus one half, which